else we've been doing much other than introducing our speakers for this first panel. So first of all, I'd like to welcome Tiffany Boyle from um, Birkbeck College. She also teaches at um, Glasgow School of Art, and she'll be presenting her paper. She said she likes being called a diva, but doesn't always understand it. Rereading images of the female gymnast through the figure of the male coach. And back again. So um, please bear with me in terms of the quality, it's certainly not HD.
step back to establish and analyse visually the image from which that of the diva gymnast departs from and to firmly establish a parameter surrounding women's artistic gymnastics, gender, the female gymnastic body and its relationship to the form of the male coach. The manner in which the coach-gymnast relationship is described for female and male competitors is vastly different. For female competitors, the coach is described really as being the true genius. For the male gymnasts, the coach is a collaborator and a companion in their dual journey towards success. Um, with female gymnastics, if the gymnastics competition is the main act, the gymnast coach dynamic is definitely the eye-catching subplot. Whilst I have elsewhere in my research discussed the female gymnast as if she is a singular entity, in fact she and her body exist, are shaped and perform within a constellation of actors and forces, one of which is the male coach. I speak of the male coach within this, uh, with this assumption of his gender at this elite level because um, in the vast majority of cases um, he is male. I can think of uh, really only two national coaches uh, ever <laughs> who have been uh, female, although of course normally the second in command coach is, is female. Um, and they're normally upwards of 40 years of age, so there's normally uh, anything from a 25 year age gap between competitor and coach uh, upwards. The figure of the male coach is perhaps the actor in the closest proximity to her throughout her gymnastics routines, offering last minute directions before her performance, waiting to congratulate, criticise or even reprimand her following its conclusion. Um, and of and uh, walking with her around the, the arena, they're normally patrolling. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to say patrolling, uh, but moving around the parameters of the floor, submitting paperwork, etc. Um, so I would like to work through some examples of these coach uh, gymnast uh, relationships as portrayed visually to break down some of the ways in which these images function. Um, and as will be the background of the presentation here. I'm going to return to another video clip uh, which shows a uh, Russian gymnast Ekaterina Lovaznyuk following a fall on the balance beam, again, uh, balance beam event again at the uh, 2000s. So her coach is uh, standing uh, over here. But we don't see him in this. They will count a miss on balance beam. Oh, did you see that look? Yeah, she knows what she's in for when she gets off this balance beam. No kisses. Oh. Here. Competitive individual events for women's artistic gymnastics did not enter into the Olympic Games repertoire until after the Second World War. Men's gymnastics, however, was one of the original disciplines of the modern games, and thus, by the time women's gymnastics entered into the fold, Certain gender norms, value judgments, and matters of taste were already present. Traditionally in Europe and America, men's gymnastics have been taught by a male instructor and women's gymnastics by a female teacher. However, the emphasis on sporting achievement throughout the Cold War was to change this. During the Cold War, when the winning of Olympic, uh, when the winnings of Olympic gymnasts took on significant political clout. The newfound celebrity status of these competitors led to many male coaches switching over to the female discipline. With them, they brought increased acrobatic skills and a preference for an androgynous, prepubescent female form, more akin to the boy-like um, body they had previously been coaching. It was this body morphology which burst onto the international stage in the form of Soviet and Romanian gymnasts Olga Corbett and Nadia Komnech, and which infiltrated popular culture. This image and period continues to dominate um, uh, the images of a child submissive to a punishing training regime presided over by the paternalistic demanding male coach and perhaps pushy parents, uh, petite in both height and weight, a perfectionist, perhaps suffering from an eating disorder and or some other kind of uh, form of um, abuse. As the book covers in this slide suggest, there is some um, appetite out there for this image and these kind of narratives that is, in short, of the female gymnast as victim. Um, so I, I don't seek to demean any of these types of uh, the stereotypes because they're all very much uh, based on some home truths for gymnastics, unfortunately. Uh, looking at images which portray the female gymnast in this mold, it is clear that the relationship between them is a significant building block in the construction of their meaning. Um, and 
by between them I mean between the gymnast and coach. Uh, so for example, to begin very simply, the petiteness of the gymnast shown in this slide, um, uh, to our left, uh, Natalie Filatawa, and on the right hand side, Kim Zemeskal of the US, are put into perspective and accentuated when we see them together with their coaches. Often in gymnastics coverage, we see the gymnast alongside her fellow pixie-like competitors or by herself, against which it is difficult to truly measure her bodily dimensions. Here she looks smaller because the male coach is an adult of a regular height and build. It is made obvious that they are at opposite ends of the body type spectrum in their juxtaposition. If performances are good, the female gymnast is often met and rewarded with a kiss, as we were just hearing, a hug, and perhaps even lifted up into the ear off the ground. Conversely, a bad performance leads to a father-daughter type scolding. This image here, a psychology article from a 1986 issue of International Gymnast Magazine, also infers this kind of domestic paternalistic uh, relationship and dialogue. In lifting the gymnast up, the small frame of the gymnast is heightened by appearing weightless and the coach appears stronger in his ease through lifting her. The male coach fairly frequently in elite gymnastics is more than a father-like figure to the gymnast, often being her actual biological father. Here I would like us to watch a short uh, excerpt of an interview from 2006 with US gymnast Nastya Lukin and her father Valerie, who was a former Soviet champion, in which his voice is the one which is dominant and bold and to show you her continual reference back to her father's uh, role in her gymnastics when she's really handing over so much of the credit for her success to him. I also find it really interesting in this clip, uh, after this comes another father daughter pairing and there, there's a lot of emphasis on scenes where they're both driving really fancy sports cars. <laughs> smart girl and she will uh, trust me and she will understand that uh, what does it take to be very good gymnast. It's not only winning all the time, a lot of time you lose. This is how it is in a big sport. You lose some time and you, you win a lot. This is what it takes to be great gymnast. trying to do very difficult stuff on the competition. And that's why there will be the falls, you know, and it's going to be hopefully a lot more ups than down. This is not easy to make a Olympic team. It's going to be war, I know that. I've seen this. I've done that. <laughs> tougher on me but I think that that's good because he knows what my goals are and that I do want to be on top of the world in gymnastics so it takes you know it takes toughness it is hard some days but you gotta um you gotta go through that and that's what makes you a good gymnast okay hey. like even sometimes when I know some girls are like oh my gosh I can't do anything right I think having my dad being able to catch all those tiny, tiny mistakes is really what helps me be the gymnast that I am today. And two years later she went on to become the Olympic champion. Um, in any case, the successes of a gymnast are never truly her own. Their story is told in conjunction with or through the miracle of the male coach. Until fairly recently, commentators predominantly um, uh, male and added into the fold of this American coverage in the 1990s often featured voiceovers from prominent male coaches Bella Caroli and Steve Rymecki. So they had them like wired up as they were walking out around the arena and you were able to hear um, more than you would otherwise their kind of last minute uh, comments and then kind of shouting with displeasure or uh, with happiness uh, throughout the competition. Um, uh, which in turn added a further layer to the audience's ability or a lack of to interpret the competition for themselves. In such a scenario, the gymnast is almost rendered mute, her voice drowned in an arena full of adult male voices. And uh, this slide um, is uh, Nasty Lucas' father again, Valerie, uh, who's now the newly appointed US national coach, 
with his hand placed over the face of one of his club gymnasts, um, Rebecca Bross. She had moments earlier uh, suffered a major injury on her uh, vault landing. And in attending to her, he uh, puts his hand over uh, her face and he tells her to take it easy and to shh. <laughs> I've always found this footage and image incredibly uncomfortable to look at. Her experience of pain not permitted, uh, permitted to be vocalised. Uh, equally, this image from the mid-1990s of Svetlana Korkina and her coach Leonid Orkhaev is uncomfortable in a different manner, appearing to be a very intimate embrace. Um, and as a final example here, this image is a 1996 post studio photograph produced uh, for autographs showing then US national coach Bill Caroli with the youngest and smallest of the 1996 US squad Dominique Mosianu. The boundary between the red of her leotard and the red of his tracksuit begin to be indiscernible. She holds his hand on her ribcage as she stands between his legs set apart. She is standing while her coach sits, but she still does not reach his shoulders. It is her coach who has the powerful stance, the gymnast positioned almost like a trophy, and it is left in no doubt that it is her coach who is not in control. Um, so, as my abstract reads, and with all of this in mind, uh, you might be wondering uh, why I'm suggesting that we look to women's artistic gymnastics at all um, for any uh, trace of defiant embodiments. Uh, to answer in brief, I would say simply because this image vocabulary that we have of, uh, of gymnastics and the female gymnast is really only half the story. The female gymnast male coach relationship is significantly more complex and nuanced than the aforementioned typical scenario of corresponding imagery. And I think if you remember in the first clip where uh, the Russian coach says, you know, a little nose up, um, and he's talking about how uh, difficult it is to control her in the gym and even in competition when there's a gold or a silver medal on the line, she is the one who has made the decision that she's going to uh, go with a more difficult routine, which in the end ended up being the wrong choice. Um, this, this question of defiant embodiments in gymnastics first really entered my thinking through um, two films, the first of which I included in a curated screening program of Soviet era, Soviet era cinema that I produced uh, in 2015, titled Sports, Sports, Sports. Uh, so this is a, a dialogue from the first of these films, uh, which translates the title as um, as Little Doll is a perestroika era film from 1988. And um, the opening scene, um, the gymnast has come from Russia with her coach, they're going to Birmingham, which is kind of portrayed as this like massive Western metropolis, which is really funny. <laughs> um, and in the training she has a, a back injury, and on the coach back to the hotel she says, my back hurts, and the coach says, so what, and then it's a very sarcastic tone. She, she doesn't want to perform, and as you can read, he says, you know, no one is asking you to win, but your name is on the poster, therefore would you be so kind? And it ends up being a career-ending um, injury. This is her in a later scene having the scam when she returns to Russia. And she's kind of, uh, she runs away from the gymnastics academy and um, is put into a normal school uh, back in her hometown. Um, so despite this kind of these early scenes where she is very much a kind of victim of this um, kind of production line of gymnastics in the centralised training that they had then um, in that school environment she quickly becomes very manipulative, controlling and power wielding. She has things that none of the other uh, people in the class have. She has this title of Master of Sport and she's able to play everyone uh, off one another. It, it doesn't end well, but we could say that she is a, is a character without any uh, agency. And the story that's put forward is uh, very different to those, uh, to many of the Hollywood movies that we have around Japan. Um, this is a more recent movie from 2006, and it, and it is a Hollywood production. Um, this is uh, Stick It. Um, which starts with a central character, Haley, who gets the option to resume her gymnastics um, as opposed to going to like, a juvenile detention centre for some um, dis disturbances. And she's very disruptive in the gym and then at, by the end the gymnasts who normally toe the line end up kind of following her lead. So here they are in competition defiantly showing their bra straps, which may seem like a very small uh, gesture but is actually um, get quite selected if you're showing your brush strap. Um, and as well as 
a whole other array of possible uh, deductions. So this is kind of their uh, seemingly quite small but defiant um, kind of gesture to the judges. I think it maybe perhaps is worth iterating that the even today the current quota points for gymnastics, which is especially applicable to the floor and balance beam, this is what's used for judging. Um, maintains that the female gymnast should exert characteristics including musicality, rhythm and feminine grace. And I've never understood what exactly they mean by feminine grace. <laughs> um, so therefore I should start to kind of wrap up uh, very quickly. Um, my hypothesis here is uh, that in this kind of divadom that we kind of saw in these earlier video clips, while it may seem um, not to be um, a major act, or it might not seem to be anything um, kind of very overtly going against the grain, that within this kind of uh, mode that we have of gymnasts and in this kind of um, aesthetically judged arena with the, this kind of very specific uh, code of femininity, that uh, divadom is actually a subversion uh, for the female gymnast. Um, and it's one way in which they can exert power and in some respects uh, turn the tables a little bit on this uh, coach, uh, uh, coach uh, gymnast dynamic. Um, so I, uh, and this was my last slide, um, but we can save this for another day. This is um, an interview with a, a gymnast where she was saying that she was always a bitch and had she'd like to apologise now. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much everyone. Mm -hmm.